interesting word to share with you. Uh, two words, in fact, if we were to have a title. Those two words are grow up. Amen. Grow up. Uh, sometimes those words are said to people uh, in a, a fairly um, critical way. So they might be acting somewhat immature. And your response to them is, hey, grow up. But I'm not here talking to you as though you're, you're immature and you need to slap around the face and talk to grow up. I'm actually saying something that's on the heart of God for God's people. Amen. Because he just wants you to uh, grow up. And he doesn't want you to stay as you are. He wants you to grow up. He doesn't want you to be content with what you know of him. He wants you to grow up. He doesn't want you to be satisfied with what he did for you last year, last week, or even yesterday. He wants you to grow up. He wants you to grow up. Uh, there are four P's that I will uh, share with you uh, at the start and at the end of my conversation with you. Those four P's are as follows. Uh, by, by the way, when I say peas, I obviously don't mean garden peas or mushy peas or anything like that. I just peas at the start of something. I just needed to assure you, just in case you thought I was about to open a tin of peas. So here's your four peas that I want you to think about carefully. There's power, there's presence, there's peace, and there's purpose. There's power, there's presence, there's peace, then there's purpose. Uh, let me put it to you uh, that people don't have a problem with God's power. Uh, when Jesus was on the earth, he was expressing the power of God by healing many of diseases, and people were up for that. Jesus expressed the power of God through providing miraculously. People were up for that. People loved the expression of the power. They love the expression of the power. Uh, certain people in this day and age, they are chasing the power. They want to see the power in operation. They want to see great signs and great wonders and great miracles because power must be expressed. And I want you to know there is nothing wrong with the power. Indeed, God operates by power. In the beginning, God spoke and power was expressed. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, from the power, then we have the presence. Because there's something about the power that draws you into the presence of the person exercising that power. So when Jesus was there doing these great miracles, people would follow after Jesus because they knew that where he was, there would be power. And they were up for that. So there's the power that he would express, and then they want to be in his presence. And indeed today we sing wonderful songs about being in his presence. We just want to be where he is. And again, let me, let me share with you, there's nothing wrong with that. It's important to be in his presence. He created you to be in his presence. So far, so good. And then after the presence, there's also the peace. Because when you're in his presence, he also wants to invite you to experience his peace. It is not the peace that the world gives. Uh, but here's the peace that the world gives. I will have an argument with you, and you will say to me, can you keep calm and quiet, please? And then I'll think about it, and I'll say, okay, I'll keep calm and quiet about it. But that's not peace, because I'm still upset. All it is is that you're just, you just don't want to hear the noise. So we've, we've just had an agreement to say that, you know, I won't speak up or I won't pray anymore. That's the world's kind of peace. So when they talk about ceasefires, for example, oh, nobody's killing anymore. That means there's peace. That doesn't mean that there's peace. It just means that there's the world's peace. But when you're in the presence of God, God gives you his peace. And his peace is very different. Because his peace doesn't tell you to shut up. His peace helps you to understand what it is to prosper. What it is to live in harmony. What it is to live in his provision. So his peace isn't about you being quiet. His peace is about you understanding what it is to live in his joy. So, if you see this power, and you come into his presence, and you experience his peace, all of that sounds wonderful so far, doesn't it? It sounds beautiful. These are all good things. And then, we, then after all of that, then he begins to describe to you his purpose. And that's where problems begin. 
Uh, the crowd were happy for Jesus when he described his power, when he expressed his power. They were happy for that. And they were happy to be in his presence. And they found his peace so exciting. But then he began to talk about his purpose. And that's where problems began. Because when the purpose begins to be expressed, suddenly you realize you have a responsibility. It's not just about him. It's about something that you have to do. You have to respond. Because the whole point isn't just to be amazed by his power. The whole point is not just to desire to be in his presence. The whole point is not just to experience his peace. The whole point is that you should fulfill his purposes. And when Jesus came, he expressed his purposes in these ways. If any man would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's his purpose. When he came, he said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's his purpose. And when he said that, we're told in John chapter 6, I believe, we're told that the uh, people said, hold on a minute. That's interesting. We were all right with the bread that you gave us and the fish. That's fine. But drinking your blood and eating your flesh, that's uh, no. No. And then he went on to express his purpose in another occasion where he told a rich man that your riches will not take you into the kingdom. And people were amazed, hold on a minute, if that rich guy isn't going into the kingdom, who's going into the kingdom? But the whole point of the power of God is not just to invite you into his presence and not just for you to experience his peace, but to live out his purposes. And in fact, when you begin to live out his purposes, guess what happens? You actually experience more of his peace that makes you more desirous for his presence and makes you a fit vessel to exercise his power. And for that process to take place, we need to grow up. In your Bibles, let's turn our Bibles this morning to the wonderful letter of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. And we're looking in 1 John chapter 2. I'll be focusing on verses 12 to 14 in particular. But I'm sure in your own time, you will read the verses around that. Uh, one of the practices I always encourage is that you don't just read the verses, but you also consider the verses around that and get an understanding of what's going on. I won't necessarily take that time today, but I trust you. I trust you, I genuinely trust you, uh, to read the verses around it and get, get the flavor of what John is talking about. As a hint though, uh, John is very desirous that his listeners uh, should live in the love of God. It's very important to live in the love of God. You can't call yourself a follower of Jesus unless you are following his commandments. And his commandment is to love as he loves. That's why I love and the fact that the prayer this morning was inspired about love. And then I loved how the captain followed that on about love in action. And the, the book of First John is about John running home the important message that this is all about the love of God that you should express because you've received it. And then we come up to this interesting section in John, in First John chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. And that says as follows. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. This particular section of scripture, it fascinates me, and why it fascinates me is, it comes at the end of a thought, and then it will begin another different thought completely. And it, and it sets out in a way that it makes it look like it's a poem. Uh, but I want you to see how interesting it is that John says that he writes to the children 
Then he writes to the fathers. Then he writes to the young men. You should ask yourself the question, why that order? Are you with me? Yeah. Um, you get what I'm coming from? Yeah. If you are writing to a family, would you write to the father, to the children, yeah. fathers, and then the young men? Is that your order? No. Uh, wouldn't you like there to be a more structured order that says, well, fathers first, yeah. then the young men, then the children? Or, uh, first the children, then the young men, then the fathers. But John doesn't have that order. John has the order of children, fathers, young men. Interesting. And your question, as my question was, was, dear John, why that order? What are you saying about that order? And an insight I have for you is that he has given you the order about the beginning and the end and what you do in between. The beginning and the end and what you do in between. John is not talking to literal children. So when he says, I write to you little children, he's not writing to a five-year-old. Neither when he says fathers is he necessarily writing to somebody who has to be over 70. That's not necessarily what he means. And also to stress further, when he talks about young men, he's not necessarily literally writing to Samuel. He's not literally writing to him and say, you're the only young man here, I'm writing to you. He's not literally doing it. I want us to see that John is talking to the family of God. And the family of God are made of those stages of growth. For we are told that when we come to know Jesus, we are born again, yes? So if we're born again, we're not born out, are we? Uh, some of our children would like to think that they're born out. Uh, no. But we're not born out, we're born as children. And then hopefully we'll grow. And then we'll grow into young men, hopefully. And then from young men we'll grow into fathers. But I also know how it's children and fathers. Because a father indicates that you have a responsibility over others. You're not just an old man. You are a father. You are the source. I love the word father because the father, word father means source. It's where you come from. And so, the plan of God is that you should grow from being a child who is a product of someone, that you should grow up to actually then be a source yourself. As in, that is to say that you should understand that seated around you, there are fathers in the spirit. I wonder if you paid attention carefully uh, to Prophet Esther. I wonder if you've looked at her and listened to her lately. I wonder if you paid attention to how she carries on. Uh, to me, Esther doesn't strike me as a child in the faith. Uh, don't get me wrong, she has the childlike desire to grow and to learn. She has that, that's there. But she's not a child in the faith. And I'd like to take us through those stages and see how we grow through those stages. And I'd like us to celebrate, among others, I'd like to celebrate the fact that Esther in herself is a mother in the She's no longer a young person. You're no young. You, you are no longer a young person in the faith. You're a mother. You're a mother. And as a mother, that means that you have those who look up to you. And they see you for who you are now in the spirit. But for Esther to have reached that stage, she had to go through other stages. Fascinating stages. For example, we're told that John says, I write to you children. And why does he write to the children? He writes to them because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. And then he also writes to them because you have known the Father. Now, what I like about that is that the relationship is like any child's would be anyway, naturally. Uh, you are in your mother's womb, and then when you come out of your mother's womb, you are greatly dependent on your parents. Why do you cry? You've come out of your womb. Why are you crying? You're crying because this is unusual. It's all new. You've never been here before. And then you're taking in this thing that you've never taken in before. Remember, you were, you were saved in your mom's womb. I know you don't remember that because you literally... So you were saved in your mom's womb. Things were going all right. And then you came out. First of all, you didn't even know you were in, did you? But then you came out. And when you were out, it's like your eyes open, and then your eyes had to take in all of this. And then 
and something was coming up your nose and in your mouth, and it was all new, it was all weird, understandably, your best reaction was to cry. <laughs> understandably. And we're told that on the day of Pentecost, uh, people cried out, because it's all new. They had been told about the coming of the Spirit, but they never experienced it. And so on that day, they experienced it, and they were all new. And not only were they new, but Peter proclaimed a message that would allow other people to become all new. Yeah. The first stage that we have as children is this wonderful stage where we have come out of darkness into light. We didn't even know we were in the darkness. But then somebody proclaimed the good news to say, Jesus has come, and he's lived and he's died, and he's lived and he's died for you. Because you had sinned against the righteous God, but the righteous God had made a righteous way for you to have a right relationship back with God. Things are now new. You can go out of the dark and into the light. Yeah. And because of that, those people there, they didn't respond by going, oh, that's lovely. That's, that's nice. That's fine. They were told that they opened their mouths and they were speaking glorious words, telling you about the praises of God. Oh, they, you didn't have to force them. You didn't have to drop them. You didn't have to nudge them. They experienced something new, and all of a sudden, out of their mouth, yeah. burst words of praise and adoration and glory. It's all new, you see. It's all new. And when it's all new, as we know with children, for those of us who have children, and for those of us who don't have children, you can remember that you might have been a child once before. A little baby once before. So when it was all new, um, you, you were there going crying and you and you cried out, and, but then you also realized that you need something. Um, I'm hungry here. I could do with some nutrients and some nourishment. And the only way that you can get your nourishment is to cry out. As a baby does, because a baby doesn't send you a text message informing you at this juncture. I would like to be fed, please. Um, as I understand it, Captain, uh, your children haven't as yet got their iPads out to send it to you. <laughs> Would it be possible that you'll see this convenience? Yes. No, 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 you cry out! <laughs> and you're crying out, it's so like, give me, give me, give me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. Give me, feed me. And then there's something that's happened downstairs, and you're wondering, oh, this isn't quite right. Clean me, clean me, clean me, clean me. Feed me, clean me, feed me, clean me. Feed me, clean me. And that's how children of God can be at those initial stages. I love the Lord, feed me, Lord. Oh, I messed up, Lord, clean me, Lord. Feed me, Lord, clean me, Lord. Feed me, Lord, clean me, Lord. And you'll notice, you'll notice that the focus isn't on God, it's on you. The focus is on you. you. You've embraced this new thing in Christ, you've embraced the gospel, that's great. But, but now that you've embraced it, it's not all about him, it's all about you. Feed me, clean me. And he writes to the children to let them know you have been cleaned. Hallelujah. Father, this is why, Esther, we acknowledge who you are, because you're the one that told us about the word this morning, about what God says in Isaiah chapter 1, when he says, though your sins were as scarlet, though you were in the wrong, I will clean you up. And that's our relationship initially. When we come out, when we're little children, we have that relationship with God. Feed me clean. Feed me clean. We have that initial relationship with God, but notice God still wants you to grow up. Unfortunately, there are some, some church experiences, some Christian experiences that likes to keep you at that level. That likes to keep you at the level of just feed me clean me. That likes to give you the impression that you can afford to just roll up into a place at a given hour do the necessary up and down, and then you will be fed, and you'll be cleaned, and then you can carry on for the next week. As though you are coming, expecting to be served. But God wants you to grow up. Because he realizes that life isn't just about being fed and being cleaned. You have a work to do. And you can't do the work if all you're doing is saying, feed me, clean me. That's why I'm challenging us today. We have to grow up. Yes. As I'm describing these stages, I realize as I look at mothers that certain people are at various stages. We're not all at the same stage. 
as I'm talking, I realize that some of us don't even understand what I'm saying, and that's fine. That's fine. It's fine because I know that God is faithful to his word. So you won't understand me today. But there will be a day coming where God will open your eyes and your ears to understand that, oh, that's what he meant. And it's not what I meant. It's what God has always meant by saying that when he gave you new life, he wants you to grow. So we're given that stage of our child. So there's nothing wrong with being a child in the faith. It's all good. It's new. It takes getting used to. Everything takes getting used to. You've never been like this before. You've never had this experience before. And so you need to have that dependency on the Father. That's good. You need to be dependent on the Father. In fact, there's never a stage that you're never dependent on the Father. Because you cannot rely on yourself. So it's good that you're a child. It's good to recognize that you do need to be fed and you do need to be clean. It's good to recognize those things. But there is also a call to grow up. Now this is why I like that the next stage after the child are the fathers. Because who will show the children how to behave? It must be the fathers. And we're told by John uh, that the fathers, the only thing that we're told by John, if I'm not very much mistaken, you have known him who is from the beginning. That's repeated twice. You have known him who is from the beginning. Now that's referring to the fact that the fathers in the faith know Jesus. They have a knowledge of Jesus. And when I say they have a knowledge of Jesus, I want us to picture this. I want us to picture this in our minds together. When you say you know something or you know someone the way that the Bible does, that means that you don't even have to think twice about it. For example, if I had a particular game that I was interested in, let's say to pick a random sport out of the hat, one that I'm sure that you won't be expecting me to mention, let's say that I like football. Just imagine. Just work with me. Let's say that I like football. And let's say that I'm known for you. You just have to tap me, and I will tell you everything you need to know about football. And I'll get animated, I'll get passionate, I'll talk about how they're the greatest team ever, how they're the greatest player ever, how they will win this, how they will win that. How... You just have to, do, because I know. I have that intimate knowledge. I have that desire to have that knowledge as well. You don't have to force me. I love it. And I walk in the example of it. So again, when it comes to this game, you don't have to ask me twice. I'm the one telling you. We will be in the car. And you're thinking about what conversation are we going to have? Because <laughs> it's awkward, isn't it? In the car, the two of you in the car on a journey, what conversation will we have? Understandably, I'll just open my mouth and say, did you watch the match last night? Did you see the goals? Huh? When they break up, I'll just, because I know. Now, when John says to the fathers that they know him who is from the beginning, that's what we're talking about. That when it comes to them having a conversation, the only thing that they can converse about is, didn't Jesus do a wonderful thing on the cross? Wasn't Jesus amazing when he told us this? This is what I know about Jesus. And it's not a head knowledge. It's not a head knowledge. It's knowledge in the heart. It's knowledge from within. It's an intimacy that we only see in how a man should engage in with a woman in marriage. We're not even talking just about the act of sex. We're talking about the knowledge that a man and a woman have in their relationship. He knows her. She knows him. These fathers in the faith, they not only know Jesus, but you can tell that they know. They show it in their behavior. They show it in their words. They show it in their responses. Uh, you'll, you'll see that a children in the spirit, for example, children, children in, in, in the spirit, they will, somebody will step on their foot and they will still punch the person that they will do that. Because they're children. But when you've walked with Jesus for a while, and when you've reached that stage of fatherhood, one, you're expecting somebody to step on your foot. You wake up each morning saying, I love you, Lord. Thank you so much. And help me when they step on my foot. Not if. You, 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 you wake up expecting. Why? Because you are an irritant to the world. The world doesn't like you anymore. The world doesn't love you anymore. Now, as a child in the faith, you don't really grasp that strongly as yet. Because you think, yeah, Jesus loves me. 
loves me. And you don't understand that Jesus loves you and the world hates you. You don't understand that bit yet, that last bit. But as you grow into motherhood, you expect the hatred. And you've learned what Paul says, that you will not overcome evil with evil. You'll overcome evil with good. It's just how you roll because you're a father in the faith. You know Jesus. It's, it's your impulse. This has happened to me. Let me go and pray. This has happened to me. Let me see God's face. This has happened to me. Let me talk to my, to my brother or my sister. Let, let's pray to you. Let's be in agreement about this. I'm going through, but I'm not going to go through on my own. I'm going to hold my pastor's hand. I'm going to hold my sister's hand. We're going to go through this together. That's, that's father with me. You're no longer a child. They say, beat me and clean me. Now you appreciate the fact that you're expecting the person to step on your foot. And even as they step on your foot, you're ready with a blessing. You're ready. Because you are waiting for the foot. Now, you've been waiting for the foot as though your whole day is around the foot. Because your whole day is around doing what God wants you to do. But because you're going to do what God wants you to do, you are expecting resistance and opposition. You know it will happen. You, you, you expect it. And then you just ask for God's grace to say, Father, this has happened. Now allow me to express your blessings in this. Hmm. It's almost like the Job mentality. That everything around Job, Job has crumbled. Even his very wife has told him, you might as well quit this God. I don't even know what you're selling like. What, you, you might as well just quit. And yet he still worships God. Fatherhood thinking. Again, this is why we need to recognize those among us who we know are the fathers in the faith. I think about the father in the faith as well is that they express the character of Christ. And that character of Christ is the word that Mama Jo had, had expressed to me. That characteristic is humility. Children in the faith, oh, they're excited, they're eager. But remember, it's all about them. And it's only as they grow to know Jesus more that they realize it's not about me. It's all about him. And because it's all about him, I need to humble myself. Fatherhood thinking. You are a role model. You're an example. And not only are you a role model and an example, you are other people who can see that in you and want to learn from you. Fatherhood thinking. So we have the children, and then we have the fatherhood. And then we have my, we have the bit that I enjoy so well. The bit in, in between. And that's the writing to the young men. Young men, I write to you because you have overcome the evil one. Now, hopefully you will see with me that's different to the stage that you were at as a child. As a child of the faith, you had been forgiven and you had a daddy complex. So you were forgiven and you were just looking to daddy. Daddy feed me, daddy clean me. But now as a young man, all of a sudden, it's not just daddy feed me and clean me. Now you're, uh, now you're doing things. Huh? Huh? Yes. Huh? Yeah. You're not just a little toddler holding your daddy's hand. No, 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 no. All of a sudden you're stretching away from that and not like that. It's like, oh, it's okay. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, you're not asking that for the food. You're just asking that. I'm just going out for something. Is that all right? And I'm going to show you again. In fact, that will save you to go because remember, it's still that that's giving you the money. But now you can go, you don't have to ask that to go into the cupboard and prepare the food and bring it on the boat. Now you say to that, it's all right, though. I've got this one covered. Because notice what John says I write to you, young men, because you are strong. The word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Suddenly, you're an overcomer. Suddenly, you are the one that's saying no to sin and yes to righteousness for yourself. Suddenly, you're the one beginning to take responsibility. Suddenly, you're beginning to grow up to realize that the one who has called you has called you for a purpose. Suddenly, you are realizing it's not just about the power and the presence and the peace. It's about you wanting to fulfill the purposes of God. And you recognize that in the world that you live in, one of the key purposes is to overcome evil. Mm -hmm. And how you overcome evil 
is you overcome evil with good. And how you know good is you, you begin to focus not so much on just the Father, but then your focus begins to look at the Son. Because you see that the Son does everything that the Father does. And now, he's just, and, and now you're side by side doing things together. Please, saints, please, do not minimize what happens in your day when you're able to overcome the flesh. Don't minimize it. Don't dismiss it. Because what you're doing is you're taking another step of maturity. Oh, you remember that day when you were tempted and you yielded to that temptation. And you cried out and you said, sorry God, feed me, clean me. Then you remember the next week you did the same thing. You said, sorry God, feed me, clean me. And then the next month you said, sorry God, I'm so sorry, so sorry, so sorry. Feed me, clean me. But then there comes a stage where you realize that God has given you the wisdom. So that you don't have to do that wrong in the first place. And when you have been tempted in that one moment, and you say no to sin, ah. and yes to righteousness. Suddenly, you can understand what the Spirit of God was in you for in the first place. It's in you to give you power. Power over the evil one. Now, notice, John is specific. He's not just talking about power over evil. He says power over the wicked one. Because once you beat the boss, you've won the game. Amen, amen. Uh, some of us are trifling with the little lower levels. And we think that if I overcome that evil, it will be good if I overcome it. No, 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 no. The key is to overcome the evil one. Because once you've defeated the boss, you've won the game. And John later on will go on to tell you that you actually, you've already overcome the boss by your faith. This is how we know that we have overcome by our faith. What, our faith in our ability? Our faith in our Bible knowledge? Our faith in our church affiliation? No, our faith in the one who overcome on the cross. Yeah. Ah, because he died, we can live. Yeah. And we don't have to live with the tricks of the evil one anymore. So when you're being tempted, and when you're being tucked and pulled into thinking all kinds of thoughts that are not God-like, God will tell you that you don't have to say, feed me, clean me anymore. You can take my word and you can use it as the sword of the spirit and overcome the evil And you've heard me say here before that if anyone doesn't realize that they're in a warfare, they need to wake up quickly. Because you're in a warfare, he expects you to fight. He has won the battle. He still expects you to fight. Ah, oh, but how you fight is not the way that the world fights. Because you're not going to fight by bitterness. No, oh, you're going to fight with love. You're not going to fight with attacks against the flesh. You're going to fight in the spirit. With the fruit of the spirit. Ah, so with the love and the joy and the peace, and the patience, and the kindness, and the goodness, and the faithfulness, and the self-control. And, and then you realize that God has said that this is you every day for the rest of your life. But then you realize that the more you do it, is the more you rely on him to help you to do it. And the more you rely on him to help you to do it, is the more you grow up. Uh, have you ever come across those conversations where people look at you and say, oh, you know, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> oh, look at you. Oh, you haven't changed at all. Oh, you're just like I, you just, you know, just the same way that you were 20 years ago. <laughs> now, of course, some people would see that as a compliment. Oh, I look fresh, I look lovely. Oh, I haven't changed at all. Oh, that's great. But in the spirit, that should never be the case. In your following of Jesus, remember, we're not measuring this by years. The disciples did what they did with Jesus in the space of three and a half years. So we're not talking about you have to be following Jesus for 50 years before you're a father. No. We're saying, what is your hunger? What is your appetite? What is your desire? And if that is your desire, God will do an amazing work in your life so that you don't have to wait for years and years and years. 
But you can get to that place already where people can look at you and say, hold on a minute. That's, that's not the same Samuel that I saw last year. That's, something's happened to you, Samuel. What's going on with you? You're, you're not the same guy ever last year. And, and we can't put it down to his hairstyle, however great his hairstyle is. And we can't put it down to his dress sense, however great his dress sense is. And we can't put it, put it down to him supporting the wrong basketball team either. What we have to put it down